All right, thank you all once again for having me. This, uh, this will be the last time you need to hear me speak for, for a, a while, at least. Uh, so I am talking about axioms for the Lefschetz number as a lattice valuation. I will be talking about lattices. This is an infernal day, but it, actually it's not the same kind of lattice. Uh, this is lattice in the sense of uh, abstract lattice. Is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, anyway, uh, the talk is about axioms for the Lefschetz number. So these things have been uh, around for a while for the Lefschetz number and also the fixed point index. Uh, and I mentioned these in my, in my other talks. Here's a, I want to just highlight a few major axiomatizations. The first one was by O'Neill in 1953. The, he gave axioms that describe uniquely the fixed point index in the setting of continuous maps on compact polyhedra. Um, there's two more that have been more recent. Uh, one is Furi Perospedini. They gave axioms for the fixed point index for continuous maps on differentiable manifolds. And uh, Arkowitz and Brown, that's this Brown, uh, at the same time gave another set of axioms for the Lefschetz number for continuous maps on compact polyhedra. I thought I'd just show you what their axioms were. N I'm not going to make reference to them, but um, Arkowitz and Brown, so their axioms were based on axioms for the Euler characteristic that were done um, in, the, in the 60s, I believe, by Watts. And um, the, the general, this is a good idea to start with axioms about the Euler characteristic because the Euler characteristic is equal to the Lefschetz number of the identity map. So uh, in general, if you see some theorem about the Euler characteristic, you can try to do the same thing for the Lefschetz number and sometimes it will work. Uh, so here's the system by Arkwitz and Brown. Um, the reduced Lefschetz number is actually the invariant that they proved was unique. This is equal to the Lefschetz number minus one. It's more convenient to write the axioms. They showed it's the unique integer-valued function which satisfies these properties. It's a homotopy invariant. This they call the cofibration axiom, which is a sort of additivity property. Like I said, I'm not really going to talk about these other schemes very much. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what they look like. So there's homotopy. There's some kind of adding property. There's this wedge of circles axiom, which tells you how to compute the Lefschetz number in a very specific case. That is, if it's just a map on a wedge of k circles. And then they also use the commutativity property, which is a basic property in uh, Nielsen theory. It's true for the Lefschetz number and the index and the Nielsen number. All right. And they proved, subject to those four properties, the Lefschetz number is a unique function which satisfies uh, all of them. All right. Uh, this is a, the other uh, system that I mentioned by Furi Perospedini. This is for continuous maps on differentiable manifolds. They showed that the fixed point index is the unique real valued function which satisfies homotopy invariance. Disjoint additivity, if you have two disjoint sets then the index over the whole set is equal to the sum of the two which is what you expect from the index. And a property about the constant map. Again this is the computation in a very specific situation when you're just talking about the constant map the index is one. All right. One thing to point out here that's a little interesting, I actually didn't realize this until this morning that it was different between Bob's version and this. Fourier Paraspedini only assumed that their invariant is going to be real valued, and it turns out as a consequence of the axioms that it will be integer valued, but it's not assumed to begin with that it's going to be integer valued. Um, in the Arkwitz and Brown paper, they assume up front that it will be integer valued, although I, I looked through it just briefly today, and it seems to me that that assumption wasn't necessary, but um, this actually will be slightly important in my uh, system. Okay, uh, just to summarize, both of these schemes have a homotopy invariance property. They have some kind of addition. In Bob's scheme, it was the cofibration axiom, and in this Fourier pair, it was a disjoint additivity. They have a basic specific computation, which allows you to make the computation in a certain situation. And then uh, Bob's axioms also have the commutativity property. This was also in O'Neill's original axioms and some other ones. I should say there were some, some other uh, systems of axioms. Most of them looked pretty similar to either one of the other of, of the ones that I've showed you or some kind of mixture of them. All right. Uh, the, these two that I said in, um, specifically have been generalized in various ways recently. So the Fourier, Para, and Spadini, I generalized to the coincidence index in 2007. 
Uh, actually, uh, this is a bit of a funny story. Talesian and Mirga Semi in 2009 published the same proof. And by the same proof, I mean the same proof. This was uh, copied. Uh, they found my paper and put their name on it and uh, published it in another journal. So you can still see there, uh, I've, we've, Mine is published in Topology and Applications, and they kind of, they were very angry, and they demanded that this other journal retract the article. It's still, it's still on the other journal's webpage. You can go see it. Anyway, um, I just thought I'd like to mention that. Uh, so the Arkwitz and Brown approach was generalized by Dasseberg and Julia Weber to the uh, equivariant Lefschetz number and the Reitermeister trace. Uh, and then uh, I generalized the other one to the Reitermeister trace for fixed point theory and coincidence theory. And then Dasseberg and I continued and we did it for non-orientable manifolds. And we uh, also dropped the differentiability assumption that Fourier Paras Bedini had. So it's true for topological manifolds. Uh, the Arkwitz and Brown approach seems to me to be hard to extend to coincidence theory. They use the, um, they use the commutativity axiom very importantly, and that it's not clear how to formulate commutativity and coincidence theory. Um, and the other approach seems hard to do for non-manifolds, unless you want to assume the extra commutativity property. Arquitz and Brown is for compact polyhedra, which is more general. All right. Okay. Anyway, uh, my, my the the new scheme which I'm going to describe is based on something called Hadwiger's theorem, which I was not familiar with before, but it's really a great uh, theorem if you know it. You probably love it. Um, this I'm actually going to describe a special case of Hadwiger's theorem. It says the Euler characteristic is the unique real-valued function on subcomplexes. Sorry, I'm, this grammar is not correct. There should be no a there. It's a function which is you specify a simplicial complex and then you define a function which is defined on all the subcomplexes of the given complex. It turns out the Euler characteristic is the unique real valued function of that nature which satisfies this first property the uh, the uh, value of the empty set is zero and for any subcomplexes subcomple you get this kind of inclusion exclusion rule all right this is called the uh, <coughs> such a function which satisfies this is called a valuation yeah you should imagine that for, for instance on a polyhedron um, if you specify the geometry uh, the volume satisfies this property. Also, things like the surface area satisfy this property. And if you know that the general Hadwiger theorem is, is about all of these things. Anyway, um, what's the other property that the Euler characteristic is unique with respect to? Any simplex has value 1. So if you require any simplex to have value 1, and then you extend to the rest of the complex using the valuation axiom, the only function to satisfy this is the Euler characteristic. I think it's a nice little thing. Yeah, you could say this is a normalization property. Um, yeah, right. Okay, so I saw this, axioms for the Euler characteristic, and I immediately thought, maybe you can do something like this for the Lefschetz number. All right? Okay, uh, Hadwiger's theorem, you could say, is like an approach to the Euler characteristic without algebraic topology, right? You don't have to talk about Betty numbers or any of this stuff to, uh, in this way, you can define the Euler characteristic by the uniqueness without algebraic topology. It comes from a, a, a pretty well-developed theory of lattice valuations, which I otherwise don't really know much at all about. Um, anyway, if you specify a complex and then you consider the set of all subcomplexes, this, this forms what is called the distributive lattice, which is a set with two operations, in this case the intersection and the union, which are commutative, associative, distributive, and some other things. Uh, this forms the abstract structure called the lattice. All right, anyway, uh, let's talk about why is Hadwiger's theorem true. It's actually obvious if you believe this lemma. The lemma is any valuation on a complex is determined uniquely by its values on its simplices, and those values may be specified arbitrarily. So if you specify that some valuation is going to be value 1 on every simplex, then it's automatically unique, okay? Um, why should you believe the lemma? I'm not really going to prove it, but just to give you an idea. All you have to do, so your function you specify the values on all the simplices. You need to show that there's a unique extension of this to be defined on all the subcomplexes. So you already know the values on the simplices. 
on any subcomplex, you use the uh, valuation property to build up the subcomplex out of unions and intersections of lower complex uh, of eventually simplices. And what you have to do to prove the lemma is just to prove that this is well defined. That if you take a subcomplex and deconstruct it using the valuation property in two different ways, you get the same value. And it turns out that you do. So it's really not not uh, not too much. All right. So, yeah, what I just said, if you believe the lemma, then automatically, if uh, there's a unique valuation, which is one on the simplices, and we know that that's already something that we call the Euler characteristic, all right? So, the Hadwiger theorem that I said before is, um, follows directly from the lemma, and the lemma is not that hard. Um, actually, Hadwiger's theorem is a, is a more general statement that's uh, really great. This is just the sort of Dimension zero version of Hadwiger's theorem. Anyway, we're going to use the same lemma for our results. So, first of all, the Lefschetz number is a little more complicated than the Euler characteristic. The setting, at least, we need to talk about maps, not just complex complexes and their subcomplexes, right? So, uh, here's sort of our domain. If you specify a complex, let M of X be the set of maps on the complex with a, uh, a pair of a map and a subcomplex, all right? And this is the, the thing which our invariant is going to be defined on. So the theorem is there's a unique function which goes from this set M of X, that's the set of pairs, map, and a subcomplex, satisfies the valuation property, and a simplex axiom, which looks like this. This is much more complicated than the one used for the Euler characteristic. It just said one here. Uh, this is more complicated, and I have to actually explain what some of the parts mean there. Um, yeah, I'm going to tell you what this, that. This is normalization. Yeah, yeah, this is my normalization property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, first of all, the the uh, dx means the boundary of x, which is a, a complex, right? So that makes sense. What about the c? The c is a value, which can be minus one, zero, or one, and it's uh, depends on the orientation of how f uh, maps x onto itself, all right? So if f of x is not x, f is a simplicial map, right? So f of x is a simplex. If it's not x again, then the um, we define the c to be 0. If it is the x, then the c is plus or minus 1, depending on how uh, x maps back onto itself, the orientation, all right? So that's what c of f of x. So this is my normalization property. It looks a little complicated. You get minus 1 to the dimension of x times this C, which is how the thing maps back onto itself, plus the left just number on the boundary, all right? F. No, we don't assume that F preserves the boundary. If F does not preserve the boundary, Yes. X is a simplex. So this L, L F, is defined for any complex. So you can put any complex here. So yeah, L. That's right. Yeah. So this is. A, this is not the same as say, the classical Lefschetz number of f restricted to the boundary, because it doesn't, it's not a self-map on the boundary. Yeah. All right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Did I, I think I said, I hope, f is a simplicial, yeah, right. Okay. All right. Uh, the c f of x, uh, c of f x should look familiar. It's the coefficient of x on the uh, chain map, right? If x, uh, the simplex, does not map to itself, it's 0, and it's plus or minus 1 depending on the orientation. So actually, it's pretty clear if you define things in the way that I just did. It's easy to verify if you take the left shift number on the whole space. Those things will add up in the appropriate way so that what you get is the alternating sum of the traces, right? The c's add up to the trace. The sum is alternating because that was part of the axiom I was assuming had the alternating sum in it, all right? So if you take the uh, this invariant over the whole space, you get the trace in the chains. That is the same as the trace in the homology by the Hopf trace theorem. And so you do get uh, something which agrees with what we expect the Lefschetz number to be. All right. Uh, interesting 
to note here that we got the, we obtained the trace formula even without assuming a homotopy invariance axiom. So it's as if this invariant is already homotopy invariant. It's not really because we're only in the setting of simplicial maps. Uh, it's entirely combinatorial at this point. But we have some kind of a homotopy for free a little bit. All right. Okay. What I want to do is extend this to continuous maps on polyhedra. Uh, the usual approach is to just use a simplicial approximations. Uh, but we, are, we were only talking about simplicial maps, which is too much for that because the simplicial approximation, you need to subdivide the domain. And simplicial, simplicial maps x to x is too restrictive. So we need to subdivide the domain. So we need sort of a subdivision version of the theorem. It turns out it's, it's no more uh, difficult to prove this slightly more general version. So in this case, our, the domain for our invariant are pairs, Fa. Now A is a subcomplex of some subdivision of X. All right. So now it's not just subcomplexes of the given X. You are allowed to subdivide and take a subcomplex. Okay. Still, we're going to require the F uh, to be simplicial, but only on this subdivision. All right. And the same theorem is true, and, and it's no more different. You have to be a little specific about what C of F X means, but it's not a problem. So this setting now allows us to do subdivisions. We can do simplicial approximations to continuous maps. So our final setting, this is really what, what you're looking for with the left shuts number, continuous maps on compact polyhedra. So our new domain will be, I'll call it N of X. This is the set of pairs FA where F is continuous. And A is some sub-polyhedron of some subdivision of X. All right, And then I'm going to say basically the same theorem. Our previous arguments, uh, the same arguments work the same, but uh, we're going to use the homotopy property so that you can, if you have a continuous map, you use the homotopy invariance to change to a simplicial map, and then you do everything the same. So here's the theorem. There's a unique function. I call it lambda now. Homotopy invariant, and it satisfies the valuation property and this uh, sort of normalization down here. All right? So this is the basic result. We can make it uh, a little bit better, though. Um, oh, here's the idea of the proof I already said. First, you replace f by a simplicial approximation. Then the previous theorem makes it unique because you're now in the context of simplicial maps. Uh, you just need to check that alternative choices of the homotopy in the first step don't give you different results. But we already showed, even in the simplicial case, that we have the trace formula, which is homotopy invariant already. So it's going to give you the same result. All right, uh, so actually, we can do a little bit better. This I want to improve things slightly. You can use the Hopf construction instead of the simplicial approximation theorem. The Hopf construction says that you can uh, make the map simplicial, and you can ensure that the fixed points are in maximal simplices. All right? So instead of using simplicial approximation, you can use the Hopf construction. Uh, a map which is obtained in this way, I'm going to call a Hopf simplicial map. I don't know if that's standard terminology. Uh, so a, a Hopf simplicial map never has fixed points on the boundary of any simplex. This is going to simplify our, our normalization property at the bottom. So if you were to write this, this was our old uh, property for simplices. If it's a Hopf map, you're always going to have that boundary term be 0. All right, And since everything is homotopic to one of these Hopf maps, we can just immediately weaken the, uh, the last property down there. Okay, So now it says, let f be a Hopf simplicial map. And if x is a non-maximal simplex, then the left shuts number is 0. If x is a maximal simplex, then we get this formula without the extra term there, because we know there are um, no fixed points on the boundary. All right. Just one more uh, weakening of some of these things. Can we weaken the homotopy axiom? Remember, we were, allowed, we were able to almost get a homotopy property for free, even in the simplicial setting. So it seems reasonable that maybe we could just discard the homotopy axiom, because we get the trace formula for free. Uh, you can't just remove the axiom entirely, because then the left shuts number, as, as listed here, if you remove the homotopy axiom, the left shuts number now would only be given a value when f is a Hopf simplicial map, which is certainly not always the case. And so a lot of uh, functions would not, uh, you wouldn't be able to define a value for them. So you can't just remove it, since uh, the, then the invariant would not be defined if it's not simplicial. But 
The simplicial approximation theorem and also the Hopf construction uh, require only epsilon homotopies when you do them. So in a sense, you could, uh, you could weaken the homotopy axiom to some kind of epsilon homotopy axiom. Um, I'm going to think of it in a slightly different way, but that's the general idea. Actually, the set of Hopf simplicial maps, uh, because you can obtain them by epsilon homotopies from anywhere, this, in the space of maps, in the space of self-maps, the Hopf simplicial maps form a dense set. That's equivalent to saying you can get them by epsilon homotopies. All right. So the valuation and the uh, simplicial map axioms determine lambda on a dense set. That is the set of Hopf simplicial maps. So the only thing we need to determine on all of the other maps is continuity. You don't actually need a homotopy invariance property. All right. Homotopy invariance would mean that the invariant is constant on path components of the space of maps. Right? That's what homotopy invariant means because a homotopy is like a path in the space of maps. And if something is homotopy invariant, it means it's constant along those paths. All right? If we only assume that it's continuous on the space of maps, that's a weaker assumption. Right? Weaker than constant, certainly. OK, so this is our final result. And I'm not going to try to play around with it anymore. There's a unique function which satisfies a continuity axiom weaker than a homotopy axiom, the valuation property, and this uh, normalization property down there. All right. It's interesting. I think uh, I looked back and I, I looked at every paper about axioms that I could find, and they all use homotopy invariance. Um, there hasn't really been an attempt to weaken it. Uh, this only, by the way, this only is a weakening of homotopy invariance if you assume the invariant to begin with has uh, values in R. If you just uh, state up front that it's going to be integer value, then there's no difference between continuity and constant. Uh, and so it is kind of important. All right. Uh, by the way, I think this is a conjecture. I don't know how interesting this is. But I, I, I think that you could probably weaken the homotopy to a continuity axiom in the fourier paris bedini approach. Because their arguments are basically uh, using transversality. They say you take any map, you change it by uh, homotopy by the transversality to make all of the, uh, the fixed points isolated. And then you can see that locally the map is homotopic to a constant near the fixed points, and you use the, uh, their normalization property. So I think since it's all transversality, and I, I believe you could do this by only using small homotopies, I think that, that their invariant only re really requires a continuity. Like I said, I'm not sure if that's really interesting by itself, but... I'll say it as a, as a conjecture. Not sure this will work for the Arkwitz and Brown approach. Uh, if you look through that paper, you'll see uh, from time to time they use what I would say are big homotopies. They don't use transversality and it's kind of a small homotopy arguments. And so uh, maybe, maybe it would work, but, but I don't know. All right, that's all, really.